Hey, in this video we'll explore another way to remove the last element from a list in Prolog. It's a continuation video from the previous one where we used the append predicate to do it. So I'd like to just kick off things and explain what this base case is doing because it looks pretty weird, doesn't it? It's got bars and stuff everywhere. So to try and demystify it a bit, I'll um, translate it to English. So the first thing here is that this is an, an anonymous variable which means the head can be anything because remember the bar here is like a list destruction mechanism that isolates the head and tail into separate elements and we're saying the head can be anything but we need the tail to be an empty list and when the tail is an empty list it means that we take the second argument here which is an empty list and we bind it to the result variable in the second argument position on the level above us in the recursion path. So this is the level above us, this is the stack frame above us and we bind the empty list to result and when this happens this triggers Prolog to start rebuilding the uh, final result as in recursion unwinds. But don't worry about this too much now, I'll explain it when we actually get to the base case. So as usual the first thing Prolog does is it goes to the, looks at the query term and then it goes to the knowledge base it starts at the very top of the knowledge base and scans line by line down until it matches a fact or a rule that unifies with this term but what happens is is that this first argument gets shoved into the first argument here and it gets destructed because there's a, because there's a bar here that means that the head turns out to be A and the tail is B and C, right? But we said that the tail has to be an empty list and that's not true here. This is a list containing two elements so these don't unify so Prolog um, instead goes and executes the recursive case and I'll uh, be as detailed as I can here because it gives you a good idea of how it works so I'll again write the variable memory addresses that Prolog creates. So we've got a result variable here as a second argument and Prolog doesn't know what its value is yet so it just gives it a memory address. Um, you can call it anything you want but Prolog normally uses underscores and capital letter G with some random number after it. And now what Prolog does is yeah, it, it calls the next rule I just think of it as like it calls another, it calls itself recursively, which creates another stack frame. Um, so you can re relate it back to other programming languages that you might have done. And there's a special rule in Prolog that occurs during the unification process between two unbinded variables, which means two variables in Prolog which don't have values yet. And there's a relationship that is created between these two variables that extend between recursion levels. So this variable and this variable end up sharing memory addresses and this is a way Prolog gets around the fact that it doesn't have return statements and you'll see why these come into play when recursion unwinds but just sort of keep in the back of your mind that this is sort of what is happening so you can visualize it. And ABC111 is just the memory address it can be anything but we'll just give it that for argument's sake. So the key thing here is that when we recurse down we're not even touching this second argument so don't even worry about it. Just focus on what we're doing here because what we're trying to do is we want to reduce this list until it contains just one element. So this is why we use the list destruction mechanism in the first argument position. So we can start by filling in values here. So the first argument is list ABC. So we know what head is. Head will be um, A and tail will be B and C because B and C are the elements that follow A. Therefore we know what head is. The head is A here. Tail is B and C. Prolog doesn't know what result is yet, so if Prolog doesn't know something, initially it just gives it 
a memory address so it can um, re refer back to it later when it gets a value bonded to it and for visualization purposes it's good to write down what actually the formula is that Prolog's searching for so we've got result equals g1 up here right so what's g1 waiting for g1 is waiting for the result of the next level of recursion um, the second argument whatever that is so I'll just write it down so g1 will be equal to whatever the value is produced by this expression but this expression is waiting on the value of g2 but we don't know that yet so it's sort of um, we'll find out that as we go deeper into recursion and the way I got this is that result is um, the second argument right which is g1 then this is the corresponding second argument and therefore the level above is waiting for the result of the second argument expression which is this and um, yeah just we'll follow this when we recurse back up but um, this stack frames all done so the next step is prolog recursively calls itself again and it goes to the, the knowledge base starts from the very top and scans down again and it doesn't match with the base case because B and C will get shoved into here and destructed so the head will be B and the tail will be C because that's what's left after B but again we're searching for an empty list but this is a list that contains one element as a tail so um, the base case doesn't unify with the next term that's being called so we go ahead and do another recursive case and again during the unification process between two unbinded variables result and the second the corresponding second argument in the next call a special relationship is created so they share memory addresses now and Prolog does this to get around the fact that it doesn't use return statements like other programming languages so just stick with me for the moment I'll, it will become crystal clear when we request back up as to how they used so we can just take the corresponding first argument and yeah, give, give the values um, in the next recursive level give the variables values in the next recursive level so head is B and tail is just C because there's only one element after B so that's B tail is C and Prolog doesn't know what result is yet so again when Prolog doesn't know anything it just chucks a random memory address in there it's like a question mark saying yeah I'll fill this in when the recursion finishes um, so that looks good one last thing here just to make it clear what we're doing so the the upper level above us this is waiting for the value g2 and what g2 is is what this level will provide to the above level so g2 will equal b g3 and remember how I said the second argument won't be calculated until we unwind from recursion this is what this formula is basically setting up it's, it's setting up what Prolog will do on the way back up and um, now we'll continue on so this was all done so Prolog calls itself again and this time the base case does match or it does unify with this term and you'll see why it's because C is shoved into the first argument here and because the first argument is C the head will be C right but there's only one element so therefore the tail is an empty list and these match right so 
now this means that this empty list gets binded to the result variable in the level above because in prolog variables can accept any value which means that prologs like can these two things match um, okay cool I've got one unbinded variable here and I've got a list here so this means that I can just shove an empty list into G3 and I'm all good I'm happy and both these things are equal now so that's exactly what prolog does it just G3 equals empty list and this stack frame is destroyed we recurse back up now this stack frame is comes into scope again is and is active which means we can everywhere we see a G3 we can give it um, the variable binding of the empty list um, and everywhere we see G3 we can give it an empty list so we're up to here so we've sort of we've got the variable bindings for H and result now so now we can sort of resolve what this actually means so written out we can write this whole thing out again so it's B bar G3 is an empty list so that's what this thing here represents so G3 is an empty an empty list which means that a bar with a list following it means that the bar removes the list so this simplifies to just being B and um, that means that we know what G3 is now so like I said before this whole thing here to know what G2 is we said it's B bar G3 the bar removes the list so it's just B so now we know what the value of G2 is above but once we've evaluated this Prolog's like okay cool I've got a relationship with um, the result variable above me so I'll go ahead and push this result into the shared memory address that we share so that the level above me can see the result I just calculated and this is the equivalent of a return statement in Prolog it just puts it into the shared memory address so the level above can see what I've just done and that means that everywhere I see a result in the level above I can just put a B there to signify that that's what it represents and I just drag this down here because we know what G3 is G3 is B so we can just fill that in there and to evaluate what this is we can go through the same process here so that this is really A bar B and the bar removes the list that follows it and unpacks elements which means this simplifies to A and B so now we know what G1 is and Prolog's evaluated this and resolved what it is, it's BC Prolog recognizes the fact that it's got a relationship with a level above so it just pushes this value into the shared memory address location so the level above can see the work I've just produced down here and again this means we know what G1 is so the query result variable now knows the value that they've that we've just produced from the levels down below purely because we've used this return passing mechanism of shared variables which result from having the bindings the unification bindings between two unbinded variables and as you'll see the result is A and B which does not now which it doesn't have the last element C in there anymore so that's the final answer um, that's pretty much it I think uh, yeah they're just two different approaches to get the same result and I hope going through these detailed examples are starting to build uh, a pattern of how Prolog goes about um, finding um, the results for these predicates but um, stay tuned and I'll probably keep making uh, videos on 
different sorts of predicates that exist. But yeah, thanks for watching and I hope to catch you next time.